Good afternoon. The first item of business is general questions as usual. Nice, succinct answers and nice, succinct questions to match. Question, <laughs> I live in hope. Clear, question one, Claire Hockey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to improve the food environment for children. Minister. Thank you. We have to make it easier uh, for all of us to make positive dietary choices, including by changing the environments that influence what we buy and eat. We are all susceptible, but children are especially impressionable. I will set out in the summer how we will do that in our new strategy for healthy weight. This will include world-leading measures to restrict promotions of food high in fat, sugar or salt. The Scottish Government has already taken other actions, including extending from August 2020 free school lunches for all young children attending funded early learning and childcare. And as part of the recent, recently published Child Poverty Delivery Plan, we have committed to investing £1 million over the next two years to provide additional practical support to children experiencing food insecurity during school holidays. Clear hockey. I thank the Minister for her answer. Last year, research commissioned by the Obesity Health Alliance found that children can see up to 12 adverts per hour for high fat, high sugar foods while watching prime time family TV programmes. Does the Minister agree with me that if the UK government fails to restrict junk food advertising before 9pm, which would improve wider food environment for children, then the power should be devolved to this parliament so we can act? Michelle, who's that big? Minister, but I leapt to Michelle Ballantyne there by mistake. Minister. Okay, okay, thank you for the heads up. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I absolutely agree with my colleague uh, Claire Hockey. Children don't restrict themselves to just the children's channels. Increasingly shows such as X Factor, Britain's Got Talent, or a whole host of other shows are watched by whole families and we're all susceptible to advertising. But look, again, I reiterate, children are especially impressionable. And that's why we'll continue to urge the UK government to take action to restrict all such advertising until after the 9pm watershed. We've argued that if it's not, it doesn't make headway on that issue, that it should provide us with the powers to take such action. And I'd also point uh, the member to the, recently, uh, the recent letter issued to the Prime Minister from a range of uh, supporters on issues and others around this, uh, uh, in this area, from Jeremy Corbyn, Nicola Sturgeon, Vince Cable, Carol Lucas uh, and Jonathan Bartley, who are also pressing uh, the UK Government to take action in this area. Strangely enough, Michelle Ballantyne. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health has urged ministers to introduce measures to make it easier for councils to keep junk food away from schools, reducing the temptation for pupils. Is the Scottish Government inclined to support this proposal? Minister, briefly, range, please. Yes, we've got a range uh, of... Uh, um, responses to our recent consultation. We, of course, will take on board all of the views, particularly those from uh, areas, uh, bodies that have an expertise in this field. Uh, we have looked at things that are, beyond, that are within our grasp, within our gift, with the powers that we have. So it's not just about pushing the UK government to do something. It's also about looking at the powers that we have to make sure that we can create the right environment for children to have uh, healthy lives. Question two has been withdrawn. Question three, Miles Briggs. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it takes to encourage more diesel taxi owners to convert to liquefied petroleum gas. Minister. Whilst there's no specific support uh, currently available for LPG taxi conversions, the Scottish Government does of course provide loans to replace older hackney cabs with new efficient Euro 6 diesel or indeed electric modes uh, to reduce harmful emissions. I thank, the, I thank the Minister for that answer. The City of Edinburgh Council has acted positively in relation to LPG conversions, introducing an incentive with a four-year licence extension for those who convert their taxi and private hire vehicles to LPG. But other council areas, including Glasgow, which the I'd Minister like a question. represents, are taking a different approach. Will the, cabinet, will the Minister look towards how these can be mandated through the National Low Emissions Framework? Minister. I'm interested in a range of, of technology, and I'll certainly reflect on, on what Miles Briggs said. I also saw his press release uh, fr from a couple of weeks ago. Just to give some, some, some caveats to some of that, although LPG uh, will often see a reduction in NOx and particulate, there is evidence there, particularly from the Birmingham study, uh, that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't have uh, the same carbon reduction in, in relation to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that can be marginal and actually can see levels of carbon monoxide increase an LPG converted taxi. So we've got to make sure we take an evidence-based approach to it, but I think the points he makes are, are very good and ones that I will reflect on. Liam MacArthur. Deputy President Officer, um, the Minister may be aware of, uh, I think, taxi firms in Dundee and London who are EV only now, and would you consider speaking to local authorities about ideas of EV only taxi ranks, charging facilities and those sorts of things to try and uh, deliver the climate change uh, ambitions uh, in the climate change plan? Minister. 
Uh, yes, I certainly will. Dundee is, is, is I think, streets ahead of, of any other local authority when it comes to uh, EV uh, taxi fleet. Uh, he knows that I'm up in Orkney, in fact, uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I'm more than happy to take that conversation up with uh, a city council, uh, a lo sorry, a local authority area uh, that is, of course, uh, ploughing ahead with uh, its own ambitions on electric vehicles. Claire Adamson, question four. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact on local services in areas where universal credit has been rolled out. Minister. Evidence provided by COSLER shows that average rent arrears for those in receipt of universal credit are more than two and a half times higher than for those on housing benefit. Local authorities also report that administering discretionary housing payments and council tax reduction is more onerous for both the local authority and for those in receipt of universal credit compared to housing benefit cases. This week, the Trussell Trust analysis, analysis demonstrated an average 52% rise in food bank use where full service universal credit has been rolled out. From all of this and the additional demands on advice services, it could not be clearer that the DWP universal credit system is failing not only those it is there to support, but making life harder for our public and third sector services to deliver uh, the support that they wish to. Claire Adams. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you to the Minister for her answer. The Scottish Government will be aware that universal credit is about to be rolled out in my constituency area of Motherwell Militia, and I have concerns, as do my constituents, for all the reasons that the Minister has just explained. While we know this is a reserve benefit, can the Government set out what work it has undertaken and will undertake to provide more flexibility claimants, for claimants to help them better manage their money? Minister. Thank you very much. As Ms Adamson and uh, members in the chamber will know, uh, in the devolution of uh, social security powers, uh, we do not have universal credit as a power devolved to the Scottish uh, Government, more is a pity, but we do have the opportunity for three specific flexibility, uh, flexibilities in the delivery as, we, as they are described. The first of those uh, relates to uh, direct payment of rent, to both private and social landlords. And the second relates to uh, the, the choice uh, for individuals in receipt of universal credit to receive uh, the funds uh, fortnightly. Uh, in October last year, we introduced those two choices for new claims for universal credit in full service areas. And from January this year, uh, those choices were rolled out to everyone in full service credit areas. As the member, and I hope other members know, as the rollout progresses, I am personally writing to all MSPs to make sure that they understand what those, cred those choices are. Uh, and on the third, which is split payments, we discussed yesterday, uh, as I hope the Chamber uh, understands, we are fully committed and are currently working with DWP to try and ensure we can now offer that third choice. Thank you. Question five, Bill Kidd. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the concerns raised by commuters regarding the level of stop skipping by services that are scheduled to call at stations such as Drumchapel Station. Minister. Uh, one of the recommendations from the recent Donovan review of performance was a specific initiative de detailing a series of steps to recover performance uh, following disruption of service and changes in their operation policy to reduce uh, st skipping of stops. Uh, I'm pleased to advise the member that since the start of the year, the practice of skip stopping has reduced from affecting 1.1% to 0.5% to of services running across the rail network. And we expect this to reduce further in the coming months. In terms of specifically Drumchapel Station, the extent of skipping stops has fallen from 50 reported incidences uh, for the four week period ended Saturday, 30th of December to 10 for the four week period ended Saturday, the 14th of April. Uh, that is approximately 0.3% of services planned to stop at Drumchapel over that four-week period, and I'd hope to see a reduction uh, even further. Bill Kidd. Thank you very much. I uh, thank the Minister for that reply. The reason I'm asking this question is to emphasise the damage that Abellio is doing to its own reputation, but also by extension to the ScotRail franchise going forward due to this practice. 
Minister, I don't think that was really a question, but... You no, can but I, I think it's important. I, I agree with the member that, uh, of course, uh, there is nothing more frustrating to the passenger commuter than being on a train and see it whiz by uh, its, its stop. It does do reputational damage. That's why the Donovan Review is absolutely important. That's why we have seen a reduction of it, and that's why we'll continue to press to see a further reduction uh, of this practice. And the anecdotal evidence, at least from the last four to six weeks, since the Donovan Review, review of course, has been very, very positive and that it is working. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. The Minister is aware that ending the practice of this was one of the key recommendations in the Donovan report. So can the Minister uh, tell me if the number of incidents of missing stops is included in ScotRail's monthly performance statistics? And if it's not, why not? And will he commit to asking ScotRail to publish these statistics on a monthly basis so that we can monitor whether this practice truly has ended or not? Minister? I mean, they are uh, incredibly uh, easy uh, to find, these statistics. And, of course, if the member wishes specific statistics, he can ask Scott Rail uh, for that. As I say, they are not uh, particularly difficult uh, to find. It should be said that I can see some chuntering uh, around the chamber about uh, stopping the practice altogether. Of course, as J I know Jamie Green has done, if you speak to uh, those, uh, of course, running the franchise, train drivers, indeed conductors and others, they will minimise skip stopping. In some instances, it might have to be done. Uh, because uh, we have to recover the rest of the rail network, otherwise there would be a knock-on effect. But clearly, passengers and commuters should be informed of that before they get on their train, as to, opposed to, to when they're, they're, they're on the train. And that is one of the key recommendations. In terms of statistics, I'll certainly reflect on, on what the member says, but if there are specific statistics he wishes, uh, then of course we'll make sure that he's provided them. Question six, Alec Rowley, please. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing Fife Health and Social Care Partnership to recruit GPs and primary care staff in order to alleviate pressure on service delivery. Cabinet Secretary. The new GP contract backed by investment of £110 million in 2018 19 and jointly developed with the BMA will help to cut doctors' workload and make general practice an even more attractive career. Our ambition is to increase the number of GPs by at least 800 over 10 years to ensure a sustainable 24-7 service that meets increasing demand. There will also be significant new investment in the wider multidisciplinary teams to support GPs. Details of how we'll achieve this will be set out in our primary care workforce plan to be published next week. NHS Fife has benefited from Scottish Government investment to train advanced nurse practitioners. Investing in ANP is an example of our commitment to provide the range of skills needed to meet the changing and complex needs of communities both in and out of ours. Alec Rowley. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Fife Health and Social Care Partnership has closed the overnight out of our emergency services at Dunfermline Queen Margaret Hospital, Glenrothes Hospital and St Andrews Hospital. They say, and I quote, as with most areas in Scotland, there are growing difficulties ensuring clinical, medical and nursing cover in GP out of our services. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to instruct her officials to bring the partners in Fife together to work with NHS Scotland to find a solution to what is an unacceptable situation in Fife? Cabinet Secretary. Well, recent changes to the out of hours primary care services in Fife uh, have occurred to ensure that appropriate, appropriate levels of patient safety are maintained. Uh, NHS Fife are reviewing their longer term arrangements for out of hours care and have undertaken an option appraisal exercise. A public consultation will commence in June prior to any permanent decisions being made. Um, I would encourage Alec Rowley and others, of course, to uh, input into that. Overnight primary care emergency services will still be available at the Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy. And, of course, we will continue to liaise with NHS Fife and the local partnership throughout this review process. We would expect uh, full consultation and engagement with local communities affected. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you. Will the Cabinet Secretary request that the Director of Fife's Health and Social Care Partnership meet with me and other Fife MSPs as a matter of urgency to discuss how and when Glenrothes Hospital's out of our service will be reinstated? Cabinet Secretary. So I understand that a regular liaison meeting is taking place tomorrow between NHS, Fife, uh, Fife Health and Social Care Partnership and the local MP and MSP group where this issue will be 
discussed, and I would obviously encourage uh, local members to attend that. In addition, my officials have been in touch with the Director of Health and Social Care in Fife, who has advised that he is happy to meet with Jenny Gilruth and indeed other Fife MSPs separately to that to provide an update on the contingency measures that are in place within the primary care emergency service. So I hope that's something that Jenny Gilruth will take up. Question 7, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the practice of unpaid work trials. Minister. I wrote to the former Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, David Gawke, in November last year to express broad support for the terms of the Unpaid Work Trials Prohibition Bill. It was disappointing that the bill aimed at protecting the rights of vulnerable workers was talked out by UK Government MPs at its second reading. In that correspondence, I also sought assurances that the voluntary work trial scheme operated by the Department for Work and Pensions is based on the principles of fair work and that participants are given the best possible chance of gaining permanent paid employment. At some stage, I look forward to receiving a reply to my letter from last November from his successor, Esther McVeigh. Thank, Rona Mackay. Thank the Minister for that answer. Does the Minister agree that if the UK Government are not willing to take action against these unfair practices, that they should agree to devolve employment law to the Scottish Parliament so we can finally take action to end this unfair and disgraceful yeah. practice? Yeah. Minister. It, well, yes, I, I do agree with that. The fact that Mr Macdonald's bill was, it was talked out on the 16th of March, the UK Government's failure to, to promote the living wage and uh, their pernicious trade union act demonstrate that we cannot rely on the uh, UK government to protect workers' rights or to the, deliver fair and progressive labour market policies. That's why employment law must be dissolved to this Scottish Parliament. Question 8, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to close the attainment gap. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. The, Officer, the Scottish Government has committed £750 million during the course of this Parliament through the Attainment Scotland Fund to provide targeted support for children, schools and communities to close the poverty-related attainment gap. In 2018-19, we will invest a total of £179 million, which will be an increase of £8 million, £9 million from last year. This funding includes £120 million of pupil equity funding, which has been allocated directly to schools on the basis of the number of pupils in P1 to S3 known to be eligible and registered for free school meals. It also includes £59 million that will, be, that will continue to provide targeted support to authorities and schools in the communities with the highest levels of deprivation. Through the National Improvement Framework and Improvement Plan, we are providing for the first time a complete picture of how children are progressing with their learning and the actions we are taking to close the poverty-related attainment gap. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As the Cabinet Secretary will know, the most deprived areas in the Scottish borders, only 25% went on to achieve five or more national five qualifications between 2014 and 2017. This is significantly worse when compared to other deprived areas in Scotland. Will the Cabinet Secretary look to explore reasons why deprived areas in the Scottish borders are not performing as well as other deprived areas in Scotland and look to provide additional support to help Scottish borders pupil reach their potential? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, with the greatest respect, that's precisely what I have done, because the issues that um, Rachel Hamilton cites um, are long-standing issues in Scottish education. The poverty-related attainment gap has been present in Scottish education for a very long time. It was present when I was at school, which is most definitely not yesterday, in Scottish education. But this government has attached the greatest priority to resolving that issue by closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Now, since all of the data that Rachel Hamilton has cited, the government has allocated £1.8 million in pupil equity funding directly to head teachers in the Scottish borders, on top of specific financial support to Burnfoot Community School, St Margaret's Primary and Hoyk High School, to make sure that the pupils who require the specific assistance to support them in uh, addressing the implications of poverty are able to receive that support as a consequence of the direct and targeted interventions the government is making to close the poverty-related attainment gap. Thank you. Question 9, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has received any representations from Glasgow City Council seeking additional resources to avoid increasing charges for early learning and childcare. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Glasgow City Council, like all councils, make representations every year in relation to the local government settlement. The current statutory entitlement of 600 hours per year is fully funded by the Scottish Government and free to families at the point of access. And the Scottish Government is committed to fully funding the expansion to, to 1140 hours. The issue underlying John Lamont's question 
is in relation to charges set by the Council for wraparound hours over and above the funded statutory entitlement. Where a local authority offers wraparound hours in its own settings in addition to the funded hours and parents' need uh, for these hours will, re uh, will reduce with the expansion to 1140 hours, it is for the Council to choose how it funds those particular commitments. Joanne Lamont, briefly please, Ms Lamont. Uh, well, I accept now that the Minister is saying this is an active choice by Glasgow City Council to put a burden on hard-pressed families in Glasgow. I have had representation from one constituent in a panic because she's going to have to pay £180 more a month. She is now facing the choice of reducing her child's nursery hours or reducing her working hours and as a consequence is fearful of losing her home. This is not an academic discussion, it's a direct impact on our hard-working families across Glasgow and I would urge you to use your influence to ask Glasgow, Glasgow City Council to reverse this unacceptable, unfair and unjust decision. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, with the greatest respect to Joanne Lamont, I don't treat these matters as academic issues. I address them very directly to members of Parliament. The second point is that this is a choice for Glasgow City Council to make. And if this Parliament believes in local democratic accountability, then it's for local authorities to be held accountable for the decisions that they take. And thirdly, I would say to Joanne Lamont, this government is investing like no other government has ever invested in the expansion of early learning and childcare, and the Labour Party should welcome that in this Parliament. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. And before we turn to First Minister's questions, members, I'm sure, will wish to join me in welcoming to our gallery His Excellency Professor Arthur Peter Mutarika, the President of the Republic of Malawi.